everybody, and welcome back to another episode of The Male Perspective. I am your host, Lana Reed, and today, today on this day, I have the opportunity to sit down with a gentleman by the name of Dexter Peggins Jr. He's an author, mentor, speaker, and pastor, and he's doing some phenomenal work in the area of fatherhood, and I am looking forward to spending some uh, time with him today, learning more about uh, the work that he's got going on. But first and foremost, as I always do, sir, I take a quick moment to pause, say thank you to you for making time for me today. Time is a gift. Once we give it, we can't get it back. So I truly appreciate you setting aside this time in your day to sit down and chat with little old me. And with that, sir, welcome, welcome to the show. <laughs> Lana, it is a, a pleasure to be here with you. Thank you. Awesome, awesome. Well, let me jump right in because uh, we've got some stuff to cover here today. Um, I want to start off talking about your, your book, Dear Son, uh, The Words of a Father to the Heart of a Son. Uh, do you have it there so we can see what, what we got? Yeah, let me let me lift that. Yeah, up. let's let's get it out there. I like that. Is that you on the cover? No, no, it's not. I'm I'm, I'm on the back. Oh, yeah. okay, okay. I saw I saw the I said well maybe that's him. All right. Um, so you wrote this book for uh, a few reasons, I'm assuming, but one of the reasons that I saw on the uh, internet was that you wrote it to address this epidemic of fatherlessness, right? And I was being nosy in preparation for today's show, and I was roaming around your social media, and I stumbled across a video where you were talking about why you chose to address this epidemic of fatherlessness. And I liked how you defined epidemic and as it relates to fatherlessness. So I was wondering if I could trouble you to kind of go over that again for the audience and how that parlays out for you. Yeah, definitely. So if you, if you think about epidemic, uh, you know, the mind goes to maybe some of the, the drug, uh, um, the mass drug uh, usage that uh, swept the country maybe in the 80s and mm. literally how it shifted and, and swayed the the dynamic of, of a whole society. You know, we, we came, uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a 70s baby, uh, born in 79, but but I, I remember, you know, out of that Reagan administration, the mm -hmm. just say no to drugs. I remember the uh, on the news late at night where maybe the LAPD, they were doing drug bust and uh, seeing a, a lot of young men incarcerated. I remember the images of, of the crack babies. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, it, and I remember the terminology, this is a drug epidemic, meaning that it's literally uh, shifting the whole dynamic of uh, the subset of society. Uh, in like fashion, uh, I believe that fatherlessness is an epidemic uh, of sorts mm -hmm. because what it does is that it has the potential to literally change the whole dynamic of a society. Um, one of the the biblical uh, scriptures that I reference uh, when writing this book was out of Malachi, Malachi 4. Uh, and it talks about uh, the hearts of the fathers returning back to his children and the hearts of the children returning back to the fathers. But here was the caveat. It said that there will be a curse on the land, essentially, if this relational dynamic was not rectified or if this relational dynamic was not in place, that there was a there will be a curse in the land. And so when you look at maybe the things like the drug epidemics, when you look at uh, the rise in, in, in youth violence, uh, growing up in homes where uh, teenage pregnancies, a lot of these things can be attributed to the lack of a father. And so uh, I am a firm believer that if we begin to really put our finger on this issue, uh, that we'll actually see a, a radical change for the better uh, in a lot of these things that have come to plague our, our nation. And I also want to make sure that I... Uh address another issue that you talked about in that video, because when we talk about fatherlessness, immediately people think of a, a man who is not in the home. But you also mm -hmm. mentioned that fatherlessness can also be a man who's present, who's there, mm -hmm. but he's not emotionally present. Right. Is that is that a, uh, a bigger impact, do you think? Or how does that play out? I do. Um... You, you know, I, I think they they hold almost equal equal weight okay. uh, from the standpoint of the absent father. You know, there could be a myriad of reasons why that father is is absent. Uh, but I, I do think it could be quite disastrous when you have the physical presence of a male, but he's detached emotionally from you. Mm -hmm. uh, because what ends up happening is, is that also opens the door for 
uh, his children to begin to question, why is he not in, interacting with me? You know, what is wrong with me? And so that now the emphasis begins, uh, they begin to place it on themselves. Uh, and now it becomes uh, a mental seed that ultimately gives uh, gives fruit to the fact that, hey, now I don't think the best about myself. Now I have mm. self uh issues because this man never validated me. Mm -hmm. And so it's it's a dangerous thing for a, a man to be present uh, physically, but uh, unavailable emotionally. Okay. Now, uh, you mentioned you were born in 79. I got you beat by 10 years, but we're, we come out of the same culture, black culture, the, the old school fathers were taught to provide and protect, provide and protect, you know, that emotional element was not there. If, if I'm a good father, I just have to make sure that the bills are paid, there's food on the table, and I'm doing what I was supposed to do as a father. Yeah. Um, but, you know, now we're here in 2024, and a lot of us, in, in we're unpacking a lot of stuff, and we're trying to heal. Um, is, is, there, is there an easy way to kind of come to that space, you know, because old school brothers are old school brothers, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you, you know, that's interesting. That's an interesting question. Uh, my wife and I, uh, we, we have a, an ongoing joke. Um, my, my grandfather, he passed away a few years ago. Uh, but when I would go visit my grandfather, uh, one of the things I would tell my wife to do, I'd be like, hey, babe, watch watch this. <laughs> as, as we're leaving the house, I'd be like, hey, granddad, I love you. And, uh, and this is what my grandfather would say, uh, boy, boy, you hungry? <laughs> <laughs> you, you know, because he didn't have that language. It yes. wasn't that he didn't yes. love me. It was just the way he uh, reciprocated love, the way he demonstrated love was his, in his ability to provide. Yeah. Um, my father, a uh, great man. Uh, my father, I used to question, you know, his uh, emotional, uh, you know, how he felt about me as a son because we were not uh an emotionally emotionally uh verbal family you like know many of us, yeah. he, you know he, he great provider he was always present uh but emotionally you know i didn't even know how he felt about me uh and it wasn't until i joined the military myself I've been in for a few years was getting ready to get deployed uh to iraq when um operation iraqi freedom uh started and my father sat there and told me, he said, you know, son, I apologize for not being there at your football games. I know mm. your mom was always there, but I want you to know that I'm proud of you and that I love you. Uh, and, and literally, you know, here it is. I'm, I'm at the time, maybe 24 years old. And, and it almost like uh, it was like a healing bomb. It like in that moment, 24 years was just seemed up in that that one conversation and from that day forward, we've been able to emote. Okay. And, and the great thing is, is that what it did was it actually opened up the door for him to be able to be more expressive with my brothers. And like fashion, we're expressive with each other. And so uh, what, a you know, as a means of answering your question, I, I believe that it really takes us making a decision. That's why I got on my board. Uh, I feel like that's the answer for a lot of things. It, mm -hmm. it starts with a decision. You know, even though I didn't get it growing up, I'm deciding today that I'm going to be what it is that I needed. Okay. Uh, and even for my own children, you know, it's important for me that even though, you know, I wasn't hearing it for the first 20 plus years of my life, that growing up under this roof, that they understand that, you know what, my, my dad loves me. I never have to question that. Because he he tells me, he shows me, uh, not only is he a provider uh, as far as finances, as far as uh, the things we need in the house, but emotionally he's available. And so now I don't have to question uh, these things that I'm dealing with. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll say this and I'll be quiet because as you mentioned, those <laughs> pastors we like to get. Uh, one of the things that is very uh, near and dear to my heart is this, that my children I will not have to fight the battles that I was supposed to win. Uh, and, and for me, as far as getting over that hurdle of um, not feeling validated in the home, that's one thing that my children would not have to deal awesome. with. So.
Awesome. I like that. I like that. And then, you know, listen to your story. It parallels so many of our stories where the child has to learn to give the parents some grace at some point in time because dad did the best he could and he's here now and he's willing to make the adjustments and make the changes and you two can come you know, in that healing balm and, and grow and, be, and and become better together as a team. So, I mean, that's 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 also a part of the piece because sometimes we see fractured relationships, parent and child, because the parent, the child doesn't want to forgive the parent for the mistakes that they made. So, I, I think that's part of the process. Well, l- let me get back to this book because I'm I, I can yap too. I can yap too. So, let me get back to back to the book. Um, when it comes to fatherlessness, um, and, and you talk about the epidemic of fatherlessness it would lead one to assume that in the future, what we're going to see, and it's parlaying out probably now, um, is a group of people who are embarking on creating families, but don't have real life examples to follow, you know, to follow when they're doing this. So what advice would you give to a young man who's about to create a family who has come from a fatherless home, or for that matter, um, a young girl who's about to pick a partner to to be the father to her child, and she's come from a fatherless home. I mean, how how do we resolve some of this? I don't have any working knowledge of how this works. How do I how do I make this work? One of the things I often tell people is, uh, if you didn't have it in in your home, look for it somewhere else. Um, and, and what I mean by that is is that. Uh, that you could be mentored from afar. Uh, if you didn't have a father, uh, father figure, uh, there are examples around you. Um, you know, I hate to say this, and and I'm not I'm not uh, putting this out there as as advice, but I've run into people who said, you know, uh, Bill Cliff Huxtable and you know Carl Winslow, those were my father figures growing mm-hmm. up, my examples. You know, and, and why we don't live uh, in, in the world of of TV and, and sitcoms, uh, I do believe that that is a type of example where you can begin to look for what you want to be. Mm-hmm. Um, for myself, you know, uh, not only do I have a father, but but I have a, a community of of mentors that when I was coming up, I could look to them for certain things, and you know, and I said to myself. I actually like that. You know, I want to Mm -hmm. incorporate that. And what it did, it was it served as a catalyst for me to begin to ask questions. Hey, why do you pray with your family? You know, why why is it important that you take off on Friday evenings at three o'clock? You know, and and the reason would be, hey, I want to be there for my son's football game or I want to be for my there for my daughter's event. Uh, And so what they were showing me was is that they prioritize family. They prioritize being the one creating a structure. And so for me, it became an example for things that I myself wanted to incorporate when I did become uh, a father. Uh, For the young lady, you know, who's uh, engaging uh, a young man and asking herself, hey, is this the type of man uh, that I want to be? I would just recommend similar advice. You know, oftentimes uh, we as men, uh, I think, uh, you know, sometimes we have a tendency to talk to young ladies and, you know, they could be so smitten, you know, or, you know, overwhelmed by uh, Ms. Reed. I would say some other stuff, but it, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to keep it clear today. But, you know, uh, but sometimes they can get caught up in the facade of love. Mm-hmm. That, uh, they overlook a lot of uh, red flags. And, and what I would say is simply this, you know, don't ignore the red flags, uh, but seek wisdom and counsel. Uh, uh, find if, if there's no man, you know, that you're, uh, directly connected to speak to his wife, you know, mm-hmm. ask them, uh, what makes the relationship work? You know, what are some of the things that behind closed doors that you guys might be struggling with that I might have a misconception of right now because I'm not where you're at. Mm-hmm. So I can be ready for when that season of marriage comes that, when I see this issue that I myself am ready to handle it. Okay. So you're out there uh, mentoring, being a surrogate father for some young folks out there, I'm assuming. Uh, I am. Uh, in, in many ways, I think I've become a de facto father figure to a lot, a lot <laughs> of people. 
Uh, and ironically, it's not just uh, young young people. Um, mm -hmm. There's actually men who are my age. There's men who are older than me who said, you know, in in many ways, I look to you as a father figure. Yes. Uh, and, and and it used to be kind of scary when I would hear that. It would it would be um, a little alarming. But but now I understand it as, as a calling. Uh, maybe they just see something in my life. But also I connect with the significance of what a father is. And so I, I don't run away from the responsibility of it uh, anymore either. Awesome. Love it. Love it. Okay. Leader, leadership, I think that is a core element that uh, fathers or men don't understand, especially when it comes to, to the family structure, because you you guys are the, the leaders, and not only providers, protectors, but leadership. So I'm hearing a lot of, a lot of leadership going on there. Uh, well, definitely. Uh, it's funny you say that. I, I was talking to a, a friend of mine the other day and I said, you know, uh, the term husband comes from house band, mm -hmm. uh, the one who holds it together. And so, you know, essentially uh, a father, you are uh, the first leader. You become the example to your children. Uh, the Bible speaks of children being as arrows in the quiver of of, of, the, of the father, meaning that Fathers are supposed to send, uh, launch the children in the direction that they're supposed to go. And so that's a great deal of responsibility to, to literally be trusted with the life of someone else and to lay the foundation for their own success. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's definitely a, a responsibility that I don't shy away from, but it is very, it's a very humbling thing. <laughs> it, uh, you know, you've been tasked and, and you're starting to see you know, some of the lessons that uh, you've implemented as yes. you play out in real life is, is definitely, uh, it's humbling for sure. Beautiful, beautiful. Doing God's work though, doing God's work though. Um, let me segue real quick uh, because you're doing some work with our young people uh, that have been incarcerated. And I mean, that's kudos to you. That's, that's amazing. But I want to ask you, uh, and let me see here. Uh, because we were talking earlier about being uh, kind of correct about things. So let me see if I can phrase this correctly. Uh, I, I don't want to generalize everybody. I don't want to, I don't want to put everybody in one bucket. Uh, everybody's circumstances are different, but as you were doing this work with our young people that have uh, encountered law enforcement or have been incarcerated, are there some factors that are contributing to them encountering these situations? Do, do you see? Uh, there are. And so uh, allow me to say this. First and foremost, uh, a few years ago, I actually started a nonprofit um, that does a mentorship for at-risk youth. Okay. Um, the reason why that nonprofit was started was because at the time I was a uh, mentor and a volunteer at a prison, at a youth uh, detention camp. Okay. Uh, fast forward a couple of years later, I'm now a counselor at that same youth detention camp. Uh, and some of the dynamics that for our young men, of course, there's an economic component uh, from the standpoint of if you grew up in poverty, that there's a, a greater likelihood that you may be involved in some type of criminal activity. Uh, but I, I I'll tell you that a lot of these young men as well, uh, there is a, a, a missing man in the home. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, they begin to look for what they don't have in, in a, unfortunately, they're looking in a lot of the wrong places. Uh, they're looking for validation. And so if that man is not in the home providing that validation, then one of the things that will happen is, is that the streets will provide that validation. Uh, oftentimes, we, they're validated by doing, once again, the wrong thing. But in the eyes of that that subset or that community, you know, they're being encouraged and, mm -hmm. and, and they get the pat on the bat and, you know, and they get the reputation uh, for being, you know, uh, this bad dude. Uh, but as a result, uh, you know, it, it, it winds them up in, in situations where they either experience death or they, uh, you know, are incarcerated as a result of uh, what they're not getting at home. Wow. Now, you know, me being, the nurture mama that I am, my instinct is okay. So as a community, you know, we want to rally around these kids and we want to fix this problem. We want to minimize the amount of kids that we see encounter incarceration. So 
is the solution like, I mean, we, we understand the father element, but we can't fix that right now. Is the solution like longer sentences, charging the parents? I mean, what are, what are some ways that we can fix this? Lana, uh, I'm actually a proponent of uh, reformation centers where uh, from from a community standpoint, uh, uh, you mentioned it in our in our backdoor conversation <laughs> that you are a, a military brat, uh, and I'm a military brat as well. Uh, and so, growing up, I wasn't around my immediate family, i.e., my my aunts and my uncles, uh, but I was around a community of yes. people uh, who could tell my mom if I was acting, yes. up, tell my dad if I was Remember doing. Remember that, mm -hmm. you know, and and, and I haven't seen that you know, it, lately. Matter of fact, mm -hmm. I haven't seen it in a, a long time. Mm -hmm. But if we can get back to a place where as a community, uh, we can trust one another to to speak into the lives of our children. Um, I, I, I think that can serve uh, to really uh, minimize a, a lot of the issues that we see, uh, especially within the prison system. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't, I do not think that longer sentences are, are necessarily uh, the answer, mm -hmm. uh, because what ends up happening, at least from from my perspective, from the work that I do, um, a, a lot of these young men are morphing into something that they're not as a result of feeling like they have to blend in. It's almost like a, a defense mechanism where, hey, you know, I have to be tough or okay. I have to join this gang, you know, even though uh I was actually a, an okay kid. I just, you know, made a dumb mistake on the outside. But, yeah, you know, sure. I went from having a, a 12 month sentence to now I'm looking at 36 months because I'm being caught up into things that are, I feel necessary as a means of keeping myself safe here while incarcerated. And so, no, I, I actually do not uh, believe in longer sentences. I believe in a more uh, hands-on approach by the community as far as uh, impacting the lives of our young people. Okay, so that means that us as adults are going to have to come together because there's a lot of, from what I hear, you know, don't tell me how to raise my kids, don't tell me what, but we have to get back to, uh, like you were mentioning, sense of community. I remember grandmother being able to reprimand any kid in a neighborhood, right. you know? So we, we kind of have to get back to that if we want to see some correction is, is kind of what I'm hearing. Um, but that's that's on us. It, it is, you know, you know I, I, <laughs> I, think, I think back in the day, we had more adults who were willing to get out there and, and say something to the kids. It's almost like the parents would vet the friends <laughs> of, of the kids. Uh, and, and, and in that vetting process, what they're saying is I'm going to also take you up under my wing mm -hmm. for your parents. Let me, let me talk to your parents. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's, there's not much of that these days, but, but unfortunately what ends up happening is, is that parent who says, well, who are you to tell me to raise my kid when the kid begins to make these bad choices? Now they don't have a community. And, and, and so mm -hmm. now they're scrambling for support when they had been pushing the support away from the beginning. And so, so we, we have to, from the position of maturity, uh, hopefully be, be willing to make these changes and, and embrace this, this concept. Do you see that um, once a child has encountered uh, the prison system, the uh, rehabilitation programs or the, you know, the, Reentry programs are being are effective, or do you see some some ways we need to change and adjust that? Um, I am going to <laughs> as best as I can uh, walk a fine line on this. There question. you go. We, we appreciate uh, it. <laughs> uh, I'll say this: in the state of Georgia, um, the recidivism rate is about fifty percent. Um, uh, Across the board, young people are open. I wouldn't say adults, you. but okay. uh, but it's not too far off for 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 youth wow. as well. I need to uh, go back to some some studies, yes. okay, to make sure. But but it's really high. Um, one of the things that uh, as as you're aware, I've I've heard you speak to some of your previous guests uh, along these topic lines. Uh, 
Prison is a multi-billion dollar industry. Mm -hmm. um, the the reality is is that uh, there is a uh, there's a market that is anticipating young people uh, being incarcerated, uh, and so they are posturing themselves for for this to happen. Um, as it, in in terms of the rehabilitation programs, uh, at the end of the day, they're you have to take ownership of the process for yourself. I contend from the standpoint of we're, we are hoping that once they're incarcerated, that they choose rehabilitation. Why wait until they get into, uh, into a, a very inhumane environment? And I say mm. inhumane from the standpoint of it's not natural to be behind bars. It's not natural to, um, to feel like you have to defend yourself 24 seven. These are not natural mm -hmm. uh, circumstances. So why expect them uh, when they get here that now all of a sudden they're going to be like gun co about rehabilitation. Let's meet them before they get to the place of incarceration. Uh, and so when I was mentioning these rehab rehabilitation centers, why not have these places where you can do wraparound services for the whole family uh, where mom can, and, and, you know, and, and maybe dad can learn about uh, personal finances. You know, uh, children can learn some skills outside of just playing sports. You know, maybe mm -hmm. uh, uh, where we can work with wood and, and build something, you know, yeah. or, you know, let, let's, let's really be intentional about creating environments where we have a thriving society because we're providing the resources that people need. Uh, we're providing the resources that in most cases, because people don't have them, they actually commit these crimes. Mm -hmm. And so let's be more on the forefront of uh, heading off the issue as opposed to allowing the issue to take place and then hoping that they'll take advantage of it once they're incarcerated. Right, right. I like you mentioned the trade um, school element or, or getting back to trades, because I think um, that's a viable economic financial opportunity for a lot of young people that it's not explored. And sometimes I think when it comes to committing crime, it's not just for the fun of it. It's, it's a, you know, I, I, I'm just, I come from a poor, a, a po a impoverished environment. So sometimes that's why I'm committing these crimes. So, so when it comes to um, incarceration of young people, most likely being impacted or, or coming from fatherless homes. Um, I remember when I was in high school, I think home ec, we had a, a, a portion of the class where the teacher paired you up with a, for me, paired you up with a, a boy and give us this egg. And we'd have to carry around this egg for the week and pretend to be parents, you know? Mm -hmm. So we understood the impact of bringing these children into the world and the responsibility of it. It was like a crash course. Um, when do we need to start to kind of educating young people about the responsibility of their choices when it comes to fatherhood, motherhood, um, setting yourself up for creating an optimal family structure. We know life happens, sometimes it doesn't, but you know, I mean, how do we, how do we go about uh, a society kind of starting to pour into our children right out the gate, you know, like, hey, there's some, there's some long-term consequences to this. I remember that same class. <laughs> <laughs> we we didn't have the egg, we had the doll, but I remember the same uh fighting with each other, like, no, I got stuff to do. <laughs> you keep it today. <laughs> uh, you, you know, uh <laughs> I I don't think we give our young people enough credit from the standpoint of the information they're already operating with. Okay. okay. Um, I, I've talked to 13-year-olds who are very sexually uh in engaged wow uh, i mean they'll, they'll they'll tell you stuff you probably never heard of before you know we were just playing doctor and house but they <laughs> yeah. just okay uh, i mean i mean they they're having experiences that you know oh, at 13 wow. and, uh, you know i didn't even think was a thing but uh so I, I say that to say this um i i think it's important to begin having that conversation very early 
you can temper how the conversation goes. But uh, I started having that conversation with my sons as early as eight and nine. Okay. Uh, you know, it, it was very basic, but it's become progressively more involved the older mm -hmm. they, they, they are. Uh, one of the things I tell my kids all the time is this. One of the most important decisions you'll ever make in life is who you have children with. Yeah, or um, and, and, you know, when you're young, you're not thinking about that. You're thinking about the pleasure of the act. Uh, but when the children come into the world and now you're faced with those responsibilities, uh, you're also faced with uh, maybe the attitudes and the un the unknown norms of the individual you had that child with. You know, these become those factors that uh, will either uh, drive you crazy or, you know, just uh, whatever. You know, these are the things that you don't know that you need to know about prior to having kids. And, and so, uh, of course, you know, I, I, the best deterrence uh, for having uh, unexpected children is not having sex at all. Mm -hmm. uh, but realistically, uh, if you need, if you feel like you you can't, go without having sex, then of course, you know, use contraception. Um, but uh, I, I encourage my kids, hey, look, uh, this is not something you want to just lightly get, get into. It, it, it looks glamorous. You know, I, I don't I don't know where that whole concept of uh, uh, having kids early became a glamorous thing. But mm -hmm. Um, but but there's a lot of responsibilities. There's a lot of headache. There's a lot of disappointments. Uh, I know some people who had children very early and they're frustrated with life because mm -hmm. they feel like they've missed out on a lot of the um, the the great times. You know mm -hmm. that come when you hit your twenties, you know because they were raising kids. They felt like no one was there to support them. Mm -hmm. Well, the reality is is that hey, these are your children. And so, uh, you, you know, they, they feel like maybe people are, you know, mishandling them or people have neglected them, but they're not neglecting you. They're forcing you to step up to your responsibility. That's your responsibility. And so, and so let, let I guess my message is one of deterrence. Uh, <laughs> relax uh, before you have to uh, start paying that penalty later on because these kids are expensive. Oh, yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. I, I was I think I, I read that just getting them to Disneyland is is $100, $200 a person. I said, you know, I, I don't know how they're doing it these days just to feed them and everything. Uh, it, it's not an easy task. So think about it. Think about it. Think about it. One last question, maybe two last questions. Um, let me let me go back real quick. Let me backtrack uh, because you're a military man. Thank you for your service. Hey, thank you for your support. <laughs> um, now, back in my younger day, and this is kind of tying in your work with uh, incarcerated youth and everything like that. Back in my younger day, I remember young kids that uh, had encountered law enforcement or gotten into some trouble. They could be standing in front of a judge and the judge would tell them, you got two options. You either go to jail or you go to the military. The military was seen as a opportunity to uh, redirect a young person. Is the military today still a good opportunity for discipline, structure, uh, getting them on the way? Ooh, that's a great question. Well, I've been out of the military for uh, 12 years now. Uh, but but I'll say this. Uh, I still have uh, my brothers. They still serve, and I'm thankful for their service. Okay. Um, I, I would say, yeah, uh, okay. only because uh, what it does is that on, on the most basic level, uh, it's going to provide you with skills. Uh, it's going to introduce you to concepts such as teamwork. Uh, it's going to introduce you to discipline. Uh, and so uh, it's going to give you uh, structure. And so even if you serve three years or if you serve 20, at the end of the day, what it did was it created a foundation that you, once you get out, you can run on top of that foundation. Mm -hmm. And so uh, for a lot of young people, I actually do to this day suggest that they join the military because when you're 18, uh, I can't, I can't, I, I don't want to make a blanket statement and say everybody doesn't know because obviously there are quite a few individuals who know, but when I was 18, I didn't know what I wanted. Mm -hmm. to do. Um, 
you know, I I was all over the place as far as hey, this I'm, I want to be this, I want to do that. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, I wanted to be a uh, uh, IT veterinarian. You know, wasn't no telling what I wanted to be back then. But but the reality is, what the military did was it gave me more time. Mm -hmm. uh, it it gave me time from the standpoint of here it is. I'm 18 years old. Uh, I have a place to stay at barracks. I got True. a paycheck coming in. Uh, I got a uniform, so I don't have to buy my clothes, you know. And, and, and it's introducing me uh, on a very basic level to working as an adult. Uh, I wake up uh, five in the morning doing PT at six, go to work at nine, get off at five, you know. So it, it gave me structure so that by the time I did get out of the military, I, all of this was easy, you know, I, right. I, I'm on with the flow. That's right. You know, and that's a good point. You know, I, I think sometimes we uh, put too much weight on an 18 year old, you know, because not every everyone is going to go off to college. So what do we do for the rest? You know, not everybody's going to go to school to be a, a, a mechanic or HVAC. So but we can't just have you have dead time. We, we, you know, you have to do something productive. So I think while you're trying to figure out yourself and, and, and find direction, the military is a viable option. And plus, I mean, for, you know, being the brat, being able to get out of North Carolina and, and live in Japan and live in Europe, I mean, just the, the it opens your mind to just what's out there in this world. You, you can't beat that. You can't beat that at all. I mean, by the time I was uh, joined the military, 18, by the time I was 20, I had already been to maybe five different states, two different countries. I mean, it's it, you see the world. And, and one of the things that it really does is it causes you to think differently. Mm -hmm. when, when you get out of the North Carolinas, when you get out of the Augusta, Georgias, you <laughs> you know that there's more to, to life than uh, the length of your street, you know, the... Yes. The, the major hubs in your communities, you you know that there's more there's. And so, so it is a good, a good opportunity for sure. Well, let me ask you my last question before my random question, uh, because we have been talking about fatherhood. You are a father to two young men, two young Kings. Yes, ma'am. Uh, what brings you the most joy from your sons? Oh man, that's a great question. Um, I find a lot of joy in them discovering what they're passionate about. Um, my my oldest son, uh, he played football. I was his coach. Uh, one time I was his coach. Uh, <laughs> Can't do that again. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's, they, they required more patience than I had. <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, but one of the things that I had to actually take a step back because we were talking, I said, you know, why, why did you choose to play football? And he said, well, because you like it. And I felt like Aww. what you wanted me to do. Aww. And I said, you know what? No, son, I actually want you to find what you're excited about. You know, if you ever want, if you never play football again, I'm I'm actually okay with that. Mm -hmm. But I want you to, to discover your passions. And so both of them are, are, they love music. They're in the band. Um, one plays the bassoon, one plays the sax, uh, you know. And so uh, for me, I, I get excited about that. Uh, the oldest, uh, he 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 wants to be involved in uh, software engineering. Uh, the youngest, uh, it's a toss up between being a veterinarian or, or a lawyer. And so, <laughs> <laughs> Depending on what day of the week it is, right? Yeah. And, and so my 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 disposition as a father is I just say, hey, you know, what will it take for you to become this? Mm -hmm. You know, because now I'm going to hold you accountable to the process. Mm -hmm. But but I want you to be excited about what you feel called to do. Mm -hmm. And so as a father, I'm going to help you become that, you know. Mm -hmm. And so uh so that's 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 my greatest joy. Mm -hmm. Now, you mentioned earlier that you and your father have done some healing in your relationship. Dad mm. is still with us, right? Yeah, he is. That's, now, yeah, that's how, does that how, how does that impact his uh, being a granddad? Is, is it changed his... Uh... Yeah, like, like his grandparents are weird. Like, <laughs> like, like, like as, as the son, you remember when they was mean? You know, <laughs> like, oh, that's not the same parents. Like, you know, what, what happened to them? But, uh, 
But no, nah, my my dad is he he's awesome. He's he's like a, a really solid. So his grandsons get a lot of I love yous and and uh, yeah, and, okay, a lot, lot of love yous, a lot, lot, of, <laughs> lot of money being slipped into the the pocket. I'm like, man, where is this guy had a few years ago? Got it good, you know. <laughs> All right. Well, let me ask you my random question, and then I'm going to ask you to tell us how we connect with you. You also do leadership coaching for, yeah. you know, you do some other stuff. So, yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and so, uh, listen, uh, you know, people can find me uh, on all social media platforms Dexter, uh, first name D X T E R, last name Peggins, P E. G G I N S J R. Uh, even my website is Dexter Peggins Um, I do leadership coaching, uh, do speaking, uh, and on there as well, you'll find information pertaining to the nonprofit as well as some of the ministry events that I'm involved in. Now you're also a pastor. Do we have the opportunity to come catch service on a Sunday? Yeah, or? sure. So everything is online. Uh, you catch us on Facebook. Uh, the name of the ministry is Kingdom Learning Center. Uh, I have a lot of friends in ministry here in the area, and I said, you know what? We don't necessarily need another church brick and mortar building. I think we need more partnership than anything. Yeah. Uh, and so we we do it a hundred percent online. Uh, we do some training with other facilities, other ministries, um, because I, I really believe that it's our responsibility uh, to get this this thing called Earth looking more like the kingdom. Uh, and so the kingdom of God, you know, I, it's not as divisive as we've uh, made things out to be here on Earth. Yeah, awesome. That's why we're losing a lot of young people uh, to to the church these days. Yeah. All right. Let me ask you. Uh, what product would you stockpile if you found out it was going, they weren't going to sell it anymore? What product would you stock, stockpile? Oh, man. That's a that's a off-the-cuff question. Yeah, I told you it was a random question. I told you it was random. What item would I stockpile if I... No more, no more days of those military rations and them little... Uh, I don't know if they're in them little green bags anymore. I remember... MRE. Used to, yeah, it's my dad MRE. used to have those. <laughs> they're, 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 in, they're in a brown bag now. Oh, uh, okay. Oh man, if if I knew that they weren't making it anymore, uh, Lana, you're gonna have me sounding like real militant over here. Uh, <laughs> I don't know, maybe bullets, maybe. Uh, I, I don't know if that's the right answer. Uh, <laughs> well, you know, today's world is a little is a little strange. You know, so you got you have to protect and provide and lead your family. So we don't have to understand that's part of it. You know, my past, he, I, I saw some shots of it, uh, some pictures of him on Instagram at the shooting range the other day. So, you know, Hey, well, oh, yeah. I'm, well, listen, I, as far as my pastorship belief, uh, <laughs> I, 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 I tend a lot to uh, lean towards when Jesus told the disciples uh, to go buy a sword. Uh, and so, uh, so yeah, I'm 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 of that camp. Uh, okay, I'm <laughs> mad at you. I'm mad at you. Now hold the uh, book up for us one more time so we can see the cover. Indeed. Now that's not your only one, right? Uh, no, I actually have a few more over my shoulder. Uh, a book called Perspective, uh, as well as the Garden Experience. And we're working on the next one. We are working on the next one. I, I normally do a book every two years. Uh, taking a break lately but uh been inspired by some things uh lately and so i i am actually uh in the initial phase of writing another book one last question i, I lied one last do yeah, you're son, fine. we can do this all day do your sons get tired of having to share their dad with other people i should call them down here now. <laughs> <laughs> uh I, maybe at one point in time, but 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 I will say this: I've become more intentional about segregating time for them. Yes, okay. where 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 I'm just their dad, and uh, and they don't have to feel like they have to share me with everybody else. And so when I when I've started doing that, I recognize that they don't feel like they're having to. Um, appeal for my attention because they mm -hmm. you know they have it and so uh so 
so yeah so at one point in time i would say yes now i would say that because we implemented some things that that they're better about it now okay awesome awesome well, as we close out, I want you to pass on to your wife my condolences for being the only lady in the house. I'm pretty sure that can be a little stressful for her at times, uh, but uh, she's taking it like a champ, I'm sure. So, you know, please give her my condolences uh, and I, I, my I will, prayers. I will. Well, actually, actually, my, my mother-in-law stays with us as well. So. Oh, okay. So she's got uh, some backup. So she's good. She got some backup. She got yeah. some backup. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, that's great. Well, you know, I, I just want to say I appreciate you for all that you do, um, all the pouring into others that you do. Um, my prayer is that you get poured back into as well. Um, obviously, you do because you won't be able to continue to do this. Uh, but I just want to let you know I appreciate the work that you were doing um, and many blessings and in and, and favor and continue doing what you do. And let me say this, Lana, thank you so much uh, once again. I also want to say thank you for what you're endeavoring to do as far as getting the perspective uh, of us brothers. And so thank you so much for that. Uh, I think a lot of times that uh, we are very misunderstood um, people. Mm -hmm. uh, we're not a monolith. We're not all the same. Uh, we have a diverse uh, background of experiences, sure. thoughts, uh, so thank you for uh, your work in capturing uh, our diversity as black men. Thank you. Thank you. Just letting God use me as a vessel. You guys are awesome and amazing and doing God's work to let them know how um, how unique your experiences are and how wonderful you are. And, and you all have contributions in your own way and just just leaving some phenomenal impact in this world. And I think that's often overlooked. So I'm doing my small part, doing my yes, small part on it. That is all for this week's episode of The Male Perspective. I'm your host, Lana Reed, and I will see everybody next time.